Welcome back to the sweatshop boys and girls. In today's video I'm going to be showing you how to swap out an EGR valve on this 2006 Subaru Forester. I'm going to be showing you one of the simplest repairs on a Subaru EJ. This one here is extremely easy and something that anybody could do. It is repairing the EGR valve. As you can see there, the top of the existing EGR valve over here is missing. Why? I don't know. I'm assuming that they took the valve off because this portion of the valve is stuck. The chamber which opens up so that it will release the gas from the combustion chamber into the intake to be recycled. That is precisely what EGR is. EGR recycles the exhaust gases that are inert and shove them back into the combustion chamber in order to increase density and help with fuel economy as well as emissions. The earlier systems were a real pain in the ass, but these ones here are actually relatively easy. They're all pretty much computer controlled and there's not really much to them. So as described by the customer, the issue that these people were trying to fix was a constant mis fire at idle. That generally indicates that the valve is stuck open. But they ended up taking off the motor that actuates the valve. And I should be able to push this down freely, but I can't. So that's an indication that our valve is now currently seized in place. The good thing is for the customer is that, of course, I have a used one, which is in good working condition, because these things are quite expensive up here in the north. Roughly anywhere from like two to three hundred bucks, depending on the model of car that you have and the particular setup for and whatever brand you may purchase when looking for an EGR valve. I don't usually recommend replacing them unless it's seized beyond the point where you can't actually fix this little valve inside there or the motor itself has gone bad. These things usually don't go bad. I've had these things on cars that have about 400 plus thousand kilometers on them. I have had them with the valve seize up which of course can be fixed on the bench if you want to do a little bit of work but some mechanics like these guys here opted out of that work and just took the easy way out. The vibration stopped but the check engine stayed on and the customer of course because he doesn't drive the vehicle very much I guess was okay with it being on because of course his drivability issue was gone but he was told to live with the light for no real reason. Now in relation to this mess there are a few codes that are popping up from the computer. One of them for sure is related to this guy here which is the P0400 code which indicates a flow malfunction. Of course, we're not getting any flow because the valve isn't actuating. The second code that is in relation to this, I think, is the P2097 code, which is in relation to fuel trim being too rich. If you don't have your inert gas taking up some of the area in the combustion chamber, you're going to get a little bit of a richer burn. So over time, I think that's why that code may have set. I'm not 100% sure, but that's my theory. Now, there's also a couple of other codes that are not in relation to this. One has to do with the O2 sensor and it hasn't come back right away. So I'm not sure whether they had disconnected the O2 sensor because the customer had said that they were messing with the O2 sensor in order to correct the EGR problem, which makes zero sense to me. We've cleared the codes. We're going to test drive this thing and see what comes back. We also have a misfire code for number three and two, which I'm not overly concerned about. I'm going to check to see if there's any oil or residue around the spark plug wires, which if you have the same codes, you should check as well. And then we'll deal with it as they come back. Obviously, we can see that we have an issue with our EGR, so we're going to go ahead and remedy that. That's enough rambling. First off, please subscribe to the channel. Second, I hope most of that made sense. If it did, great. If it didn't, stick around and I'll show you how to swap this guy out. Now let's get on with the show. Now boys and girls, this is a very simple job. Essentially, you need a small pocket-sized flat screwdriver just to help with wiggling off the connector. And then all you need is a 12 millimeter socket, shallow, and an extendable ratchet or just a regular ratchet if you have Gorilla Strength. If you do have Gorilla Strength, you'll need a torque wrench so that you don't damage the bolts or break them off in your intake manifold, which will bring tears to your eyes. So make sure that when and putting it back, you employ the use of a torque wrench if you are overly strong and not aware of how much torque you apply to small bolts. There are two bolts that hold in your EGR valve. What you want to do is get your 12 millimeter on them and crack them loose. This one came apart quite easily, thank God. On some of the newer EJ models, 
there is an open spot here on the casting. On the 2009 Forester, my own car, this problem happened to me where there was a slight opening in the casting. There was plenty of rust and corrosion that built up in there and it didn't come out as easily. Now, some of the castings like this one have a hole but don't have any issues. So if you have one that is very tight, make sure that you spray some WD-40 down in there so that you don't have to drill that bolt out because it is a very traumatizing experience, especially when you have to do it in minus 10 degree weather like I did. And stupid me, because there was sun shining out, I decided to do it in the front of my shop instead of inside. Don't make the same mistakes that I make, boys and girls. This is why I tell you about my stupidity. As you can see here, our valve is loose. We also have the gasket. Make sure the gasket doesn't fall into the abyss of the engine bay. Put your hand underneath when you get the bolt almost all the way out. And if you can, grab your gasket. This here is the gasket that I am talking about. It is reusable, do not throw it away, and don't put on that paper, whatever type of gasket it is, it's a pile of crap, just reuse this one. You can also put a little bit of silicone on it if it makes you feel a little bit better. Well, boys and girls, you can see that we're not getting any flow. There's also condensation and all sorts of crap inside there. So we're going to see if we can free this up later on in the video, just for fun, show exactly what you need to do if you have a circulation code or an EGR that is allowing gases constantly in and giving you a misfire at idle. Now, the majority of time when you purchase a brand new EGR valve, you don't need to check it, of course, because it should be good right out of the box. But if you don't have buckets of cash lying around or you sell used parts like I do, there are a few things you can do to check your EGR valve. The first and very most important thing is to inspect the actual valve. Look at it to make sure that there's not excessive amounts of corrosion or carbon buildup. That's a bad sign usually. And then the second thing and very most important thing is to make sure that your valve actually actuates. What you can do is take a pocket sized screwdriver and force the valve down. It should move nice and freely. There you can see the valve actually opening as I push down on it and it closes without me trying to force it back shut which means that there is no hindrance or anything going to stop the valve from completely closing. What happens generally in most cases when you have an EGR issue at idle and your vehicle is misfiring you are getting excessive amounts of exhaust gases into the combustion chamber because this guy here isn't closing. It is usually stuck fully open and that's because of corrosion or carbon buildup. What you can do is if you have a valve that's stuck you can literally take it out and clean it up by picking off the carbon with a flat screwdriver and a pick and you can usually reuse these things. Now that's enough rambling boys and girls we can go ahead and put this thing back in the car. What we need to do is clean our gasket surface up. What you're going to do is just use a light brush material to get off some of the soot and crap and the same goes for the EGR valve. Essentially you're just going to clear off the rust and corrosion on the surface here and make sure it is nice and clean for mating so that you don't have any exhaust gases leaking into your engine bay. Now I find the best tool to clean this guy up is a stiff wire brush or a cookie if you have access to pneumatic tools. It just makes my life easier and I love power tools. Give it a little bit of a grind and you should be okay. Remember the goal is not to remove material, just the crud and crap. There you go, boys and girls. You can actually still see the machine marks. Yeah, just blow it out so there's no solid pieces of metal going into your engine. Now with this guy here, just a wire brush usually does the trick. What the fuck is going on with a gimbal? You having a seizure, bud? What the fuck's wrong with you, eh? Okay, boys and girls, we have got our gimbal functioning again, so just grind down all the crap on your... this thing, the gasket. Just cut off all the solid crap that's on it, and then you can go ahead and put it back into use. Again, don't forget to blow out this guy and put it back in the car.
With all that crap blown out of there, now you can go ahead and apply a little bit of silicone to the mating surface here as well as on the gasket just for insurance to ensure that it doesn't leak of course and then we can put it back into the vehicle. Now the other nice thing with the silicone applied to your EGR valve is your gasket won't fall off. Eh, awesome, isn't it? Which will make your life quite a bit easier when lining up the bolt holes. Just a minimal amount of silicone is all you need. Of course, boys and girls, if you've watched my videos in the past, the time has come for us to anti-seize these bolts before we put them back into use. Slide your bolts in, do both of them, and then just thread them on. Once you get both sides threaded in, you can run them up by hand, of course. Make sure it is very important that your gasket does not fall out of place. So make sure it's there and in place. If it does fall out, find it and put it back into place. With it all snugged up by hand, you can go ahead now and torque it to 14 foot-pounds or 19 newton meters. Now we can go ahead and connect our connector, of course, but I don't know how long this thing has been sitting here without a EGR valve connected to the other end. So it would be a good idea to blow out the connector here just to make sure there's no debris or crap inside any of these pins, which may cause us an issue. Now, keep in mind the majority of modern cars all have a small gasket usually around any sort of connector that is in the engine bay. So whenever you blow these things out, make sure you have your thumb or your finger on either side to make sure your gasket doesn't fly out whenever you start applying air pressure to this little cavity. Then just slide it into place. If it's a bit hard to get on, what you can do is use a little bit of WD-40 to aid you in slipping that thing into place. Well, that's pretty much it for the install of this EGR valve. Now what I'm going to do is have a little fun with this and smash it around and see if we can get it to free up. Now the tools needed to fix one of these things is quite simple. Essentially, you're going to need WD-40 or some sort of oil to help with lubricating the valve. You're also going to need a vise so you can hold it secure while you smash it with a hammer now of course boys and girls you don't want to go ahead and smash this thing like it owes you money the reason being is because it is not something that is going to take a lot of punishment also don't clamp it too tightly because you may damage the face of the actual mating surface here which would be a bad idea take your hammer and lightly tap this top portion as you can see there our valve is depressed now this spring should have it coming back what we need to do to fix this is get a flat screwdriver like so, our lubricant, and just scrape off all the crap that is in here. Now, what a few guys have done or I've seen in the past is they will employ the use of anti-seize, either copper or aluminum. That is a terrible idea. They will lather this shaft up with it, which is a terrible, terrible idea because those are heavy metals. This here, these two ports are connected to your combustion chamber. What does that mean? Essentially, the copper or aluminum content in either of the anti-seize that you choose to use will end up in your exhaust stream, which will end up in your catalytic converter. The catalytic converter does not like foreign material other than exhaust gases. Very bad idea. The only thing that you should use in order to lubricate this is simply just regular oil or WD-40 or any sort of lubricant like WD-40. Essentially, what you want to do is scrape off all that carbon in there, push the valve up and down until it is completely free then you can reattach your motor and there you go boys and girls you'll be fine and good to go usually these things only seize up when the vehicle is used for short periods of time so it's always good to at least use your vehicle and bring it up to operating temperature at least every week or two weeks hopefully that helps you out and you found it interesting and informative if you didn't well this was a colossal waste of time and if you did 
Awesome. Now here is a tip that will work specifically with this style of Subaru valve. What you want to do is take note that you have a little nipple in this recessed area here on the shaft. Then of course clean out as much carbon as you can with a pick. Spray some WD-40 down inside here on both sides. Then what you want to do is get yourself a nice drill. You're going to take the drill and secure the chuck to your valve like so. Of course, tighten the chuck up and then you're going to spin it in reverse or whichever direction your spring is not going to hook on it and potentially become unwound. So you can see there that our spring is pointed this way. So we want to go in the reverse direction so that the spring doesn't get caught up and then spin the thing. What you want to do is spin it like so. While you're spinning it, move the shaft in the bore just a little bit to break up or free up any carbon that may be there. This is not a rust related issue generally because there is a stainless shaft and I believe that there is a stainless sleeve inside of this box. Also, once you get it freed up, what you want to do is continue to rotate it so that the valve seal over here actually breaks up any carbon deposits that are left over. That way, you get a good seal. And now, boys and girls, you can see we have a good valve. Unfortunately, the guys who tried to repair this sort of situation took off the actuator motor. So unfortunately, this one is of no use. The only use for this thing was to show you guys how to repair yours at home. Now, if you are going to repair yours at home, make sure you employ the use of an impact hammer to get off the number two Phillips bits that hold the actuator motor to the valve. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It is an impact driver. You use a hammer on this side here to knock it and you of course put your bit on this side and it will generate a twisting motion as you smash the thing which will break these bolts loose because as most mechanics will tell you it is a pain in the ass to get those things off sometimes and this can be your lord and savior all right boys and girls don't forget to subscribe now boys and girls, the only thing that's left to do is to take your vehicle for a drive. Make sure that you clear the trouble codes. Take it for a drive that is at least five kilometers plus in length. Make sure the vehicle comes up to operating temperature, meaning that the thermostat fully opens and make sure the vehicle is cold when you first start off your test drive. That way the vehicle makes a complete run cycle. Generally, if there are any issues, they will arise in the first two to three cycles. So make sure sure that you keep an eye on the car obviously if there are any drivability issues bring the car back and try to figure out what it may be in my case i'm pretty sure that i solved the egr issue there's probably not going to be any other codes in relation to that and i also think that we may have solved the issue with the catalyst trim but that could also be related to the o2 sensor code that i had time will tell my friends of course if you like the video please like share and subscribe don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss one of my new videos and as always thanks for watching we will see you in the next one the chamber which releases releases oops it opens jimmy good job i have had them with the valve seize up which is of course the problem that this gentleman's happening happening oh my god one of them for sure is relation if you have girl if you do have girl Oh, for fuck's sakes, man. Galula. What the fuck is a galula? Oh, boy. What you want to do is get your 12 meter. As this, give it a little bit of a cleaning. What the fuck? <laughs> and get it back to its proper functioning way. That sounds weird. <laughs> Obviously, you guys aren't going to care about this. So all this shit's going to get cut out. After we get our... After... Ah, for fuck's sakes. Just get off as much as the solid crap. Ugh. Just a minimal amount of gasket. Oh, for fuck. That catalyst trim code may all... Was it a catalyst trim? What the fuck was it? That way it completes a... Com I don't know what the fuck I'm saying.